Hi, my name is Sargis Sadrakian. I'm a junior faculty at the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And I thank the organizers uh, for this invitation and the opportunity to present uh, our work. Today, I'll talk about extracellular vesicles and chronic kidney disease. So what is chronic kidney disease? It is uh, a kidney disease defined by gradual loss of renal function over uh, sometimes extended period of time. It can be years uh, um, and you know many years. And there are many different factors that contribute to the initiation progression of chronic kidney disease in human population. The two major ones being diabetes and cardiovascular uh, problems. In addition, uh, obesity, you know, genetic uh, mutations, tobacco use, aging, and other factors as well do contribute to progression of chronic kidney disease. I will not uh, be exaggerating if I say that uh, kidney is one of the most complex organs uh, in the human body, being that it is very heterogeneous in, in nature, uh, structure-wise, and very uh, difficult to study so. So the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron, which is composed of the glomerulus and, and tubules. The glomerulus is a bolus structure that contains um, microcapillaries made up of uh, endothelial cells and photocytes as shown in the diagrams in the right. Uh, uh, the the is, uh, is the is the is the cell that's uh, highlighted in green that surrounds the capillary structures. And between the uh, endothelial cells and, and podocyte is the, lies the glomerular basement membrane. Uh, and in the electron micrographs on the bottom, uh, you're seeing a projection of the glomerulus uh, in a scanning electron microgram actually on the left. And on the right is a close-up image where we can more clearly see the basement membrane. It's a thin layer of uh, matrix. And on both sides, we have uh, fenestrated in the fetal cells and the podocyte. What's so special about uh, this structure is that uh, nephron cannot be regenerated in adult life. So we humans are born with specific numbers of nephrons, uh, and, and they are predetermined. Usually, that number is uh, roughly somewhere around between uh, 500,000 to 1 million per kidney. The glomerular cells, namely the podocytes and endothelial cells, uh, are very unique in their nature. Uh, the podocyte is unique because despite the fact that it's a typical endothelial cell, its location, architecture, its function are unique uh, because they have these uh, food processes that uh, make interdigitations at the filtration barrier that determine the um, perm selectivity nature of the filtration function. The podocytes are postmitotic cells. That means they do not proliferate. Uh, they, they're not, they cannot be replaced. And um, if they do so, that means there is a problem. And usually this happens during disease. Uh, they slough off from the basement membrane, which uh, usually is associated with uh, onset of proteinuria. Glomerular endothelial cells are unique as well because they have uh, fenestrations and they are responsible for the first filtration activity. As they also filtrate from the capillary, it first has to leave the endothelium, then the basement membrane, then through the podocyte. And lastly, the glomerular basement membrane is unique. Uh, and I want to highlight this because uh, this, this matrix is important and plays an important function uh, in the filtration. It's uh, composed of uh, collagen type 4 a special collagen that is produced only by the podocyte, and, and mutations in this collagen or any other component of the matrix um, um, can lead to disease, and I'll talk more about this later. So the homeostatic balance between the glomerular cells and the glomerular basement membrane are important for the maintenance of the ultrastructural integrity and function of, the, of this filtration unit, and any alteration of any of these components uh, um, can lead to chronic kidney disease. So uh, loss of glomerular function leads to development of uh, chronic kidney disease. And in the United States alone, there are more than three, three, 30 million patients, Americans, uh, who uh, have the diagnosis for chronic kidney disease. And this is a major burden uh, financially on the healthcare system. And uh, in, in 2018 alone, um, the estimated cost for um, you know, CKD uh, treatment and end-stage renal disease treatment was somewhere around 114 uh, billion. So what are some of the treatments? Uh, um, we are not very fortunate because 
And the only treatments currently available for patients with renal failure is either dialysis or kidney transplantation. So, um, and, 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 and the projections are not uh, looking very good. If we look uh, uh, in this graph, we can see that uh, between 1999 and 2015, the number of transplantations were relatively constant, you know, somewhere around between 17 to 18,000 uh, annually, whereas um, the number of patients in the, in the transplant waiting list, waiting for a donor organ to have a transplantation has been growing um, over the years. And, uh, and these numbers are even higher, you know, currently. So um, this is a, a tabulation of all the uh, different, you know, etiologies or kidney diseases that uh, um, lead to eventually uh, kidney transplantation. Uh, as you can see, the number is uh, the number is huge, and the conditions range from uh, renal cancer to uh, familial conditions uh, to glomerular uh, sclerosis, and uh, you know even sickle, sickle cell anemia can lead to uh, kidney disease. So the conditions are are enormous. If uh, we take a historical look uh, as to where we stand right now and what are the opportunities, as I mentioned, dialysis and kidney transplantations are are two main mainstream therapies uh, for kidney replacement. Uh, but both of these were, were discovered uh, back, uh, back in the 1940s and 1950s. And only in, in 1983, we had the introduction of immunosuppressants, which uh, really uh, enhanced the success of kidney transplantations, uh, you know, providing uh, support for the um, you know, um, against rejection of the transplants. So uh, in addition, uh, treatments for CKD, in addition to uh, dialysis and transplantation, have been centered on slowing down its progression by systemic approaches, uh, such as using uh, diuretics or ACE inhibitors, uh, which have many side effects and not are not specifically targeting the glomerulus. So we're in 2020 now, and uh, no new developments in terms of uh, approved therapies um, are, are known. And so some of the areas that the research uh, is, uh, is working on is gene therapy, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine applications, and even some pharmacotherapy approaches to, uh, to find a new therapy. Uh, in addition, there is a uh, area of stem cells and extracellular vesicles that have uh, gained a lot of traction in the recent years, and, and there seems to be some opportunity here for um, finding a new possible um, um, new possible therapy. And so, uh, can we? Our question is: Can we apply stem cells or same stem cell based products to target um, kidney disease uh, or renal complications? And so, over the years, um, we have uh, took a, a specific approach of using and stem cells for um, a potential as a potential therapeutic to treat kidney disease. And um, in the past, we have looked into um, using AFSCs for treatment of acute uh, kidney disease, uh, as well as as well as uh, chronic kidney disease, and we have successfully shown that single injection of amniotic fluid stem cells uh, provides uh, renal protection in terms of uh, morphology and function, as well as survival in these animals. And more recently, we have uh, taken a new approach where we isolated uh, extracellular vesicles from amniotic fluid stem cells, and we've shown that just like the AFSCs, they have they provide similar protection. And in particular, we, we, we observed that um, VCVs were able to uh, protect endothelial damage uh, induced by VGF signaling in outport animals. And I'll say a little bit more about this in the next few slides. So um, um, just like any other cell, AFSCs do produce a lot of extracellular vesicles, and we isolated them uh, using ultracentrifugation and characterized them by uh, nanocyte. And um, we can say that AFSCs produce large quantities of EVs uh, so that they can be uh, injected in, in large number of animals. Uh, so by nanocyte, we characterized their size to be roughly about uh, 200 nano. Uh, meters in diameter. So these EVs express uh, 
typical mesenchymal markers, uh, extracellular markers such as CD9, CD63, as well as angiogenic markers such as uh, VGF receptor 1, receptor 2. So these two receptors are important um, um, for later um, uh, points that I would like, I will, I will make in the in the next slides. In addition, these vesicles also have uh, a large uh, bank of uh, microRNA, uh, both proangiogenic uh, and antiangiogenic, and obviously antiangiogenic anti microRNA were um, detected to be much higher, and this was important as well. So moving forward, uh, I'll introduce uh, the. The animal model we used, uh, which is Alport syndrome, to study CKD. This is a genetic um, uh, familial disease uh, that has mutations in the collagen 4 uh, alpha 3, 4, 5 chains. In our case, our model has a mutation in alpha 5 chain, which results in the abnormal deposition of the glomerular basement membrane, leading to progressive loss of renal function and ultimately kidney failure. Um, in this um, image, you are seeing again an electron micrograph of the basement membrane in histology showing normal uh, morphology of the kidney. And upon the mutation in the collagen 4-alpha-5 gene, we have a um, severe disruption in the basement membrane, as you can see in the projections in the right, and development of fibrosis in the glomerular and tubular compartments um, shown by this histology. So this leads to infiltration of immune cells, uh, deposition of cellular matrix, scarring, and reduced blood flow. And the reason we are using this specific mutation is because 85% of human cases um, have this specific alpha-5 mutation. So it's a, it's a very common, whereas the other mutations are, are much more rare. So in addition, um, we made this interesting observation that uh, VGF, which is very important for the maintenance of the glomerular integrity, and specifically the endothelium and the fenestrations, is highly elevated early on in all port mice uh, in the glomeruli. And so we uh, were very interested to uh, uh, understand whether the vesicles which express now VGF receptors could, could mitigate this. And so we performed some in vitro experiments where we uh, cultured um, endothelial cells from glomeruli and we treated them with VGF just to recapitulate to mimic the conditions that uh, exist in the outward glomeruli and uh, treated them with uh, normal EVs and EVs that were knocked out for VGF receptor 1. And uh, interestingly, we observed that the, the, the normal EVs were able to capture or bind to VGF in the media and and uh, prevent this VGF uh, from being taken out by the cells. And subsequently, we performed some further analysis looking into the cells and uh, did some immunoprecipitation assays where we confirmed that there's a direct interaction between VGF uh, and uh, the receptors expressed on the surface of the EVs. So this was important. But then um, it was also important for us to understand whether the EVs, once injected in, in mice, could really you know, home to the kidney. So in collaboration with Dr. Bisolati in the University of Torino, we uh, we performed these experiments where the EVs were injected in mice and we could uh, um, easily detect them in the kidneys uh, um, and, 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 and image them by bioluminescence as shown in this, in this uh, figure. Next, obviously, uh, was uh, also important to understand whether they have any um, therapeutic potential. And so we looked at the uh, you know, renal function in terms of creatinine and albuminuria. And interestingly, um, with one single injection, we could see a significant improvement uh, in both of these parameters. So moving forward, uh, our ultimate goal was eventually to to be able to translate this technology. And so our next steps in uh, as we move forward, we switch from using old mouse system where we had the mouse model and using mouse EVs to a mouse and human hybrid model where we now um, use the still use the same mouse output syndrome model, but um, apply a human IFSC derived extracellular vesicles to understand uh, their biodistribution, therapeutic effect, and mechanisms of action, as well as understand mechanisms of disease progression in these animals. So, uh, in this, um, you know, for this aim, we developed. Uh, uh, 
um, you know, certain um, certain directions, namely three specific directions that we aimed our studies on. Uh, in, in the one direction, we developed uh, key assays to uh, allow for consistent characterization of uh, this human EVs now derived from consented donors and evaluate their potential for clinical you know, translation or application. In the second direction, we really uh, thought about the possibility of you know, expanding these EVs uh, you know, to clinical scale. So we, uh, we employed uh, and GMP compatible 3D hollow fiber bioreactor to be able to meet this uh, need. And then um, finally, we are also developing a non invasive, clinically applicable in vivo tracking uh, system for EVs using MRI to evaluate um, you know, potential homing and associated toxicity toxicities in undesired of target organs or tissues that will eventually combination of these three approaches will allow uh, successful you know, translation. So looking into the um, key assays, um, there are three of them. Uh, the first one is looking at the, their identity and purity, size distribution, pro production and characterization by their cargo, uh, looking at the protein and uh, microRNA. Um, second assay is the potency assay in vitro, where we look at the functionality of the EVs, uh, specifically um, looking at the capability of, of the EVs to trap VGF, as I showed uh, earlier. And then lastly, look at their uh, therapeutic efficacy in vivo, uh, where we um, isolate glomeruli in injected mice and look at VGF modulation, analyze gene regulation by RNA-seq, and of course, uh, functional changes. So looking at the, the first assay, where we do the identity and purity, uh, we uh, we characterize the EVs by nanosite, just like the mouse ones, and uh, we determine their size and distribution and concentration. Uh, we also employed uh, ex exoview um, a technology where we're able to visualize uh, the EVs based on their uh, expression of tetrasphanins, the CD9, 63, and 81. And we can really, um, this technology allows uh, is a combination of flow cytometry and um, you know immunohistochemistry that, as I said, allows visualization. As shown in the right, we can you know see really single single EVs and identify the expression of specific markers in addition to tetraspanin and really understand their heterogeneity. So this allows us to easily characterize um, characterize them. Uh, so in addition. And we looked at surface markers. Um, as I said, the cells are coming from consented donors. So in this example, we're looking at two uh, samples, um, clonal, uh, clonally derived um, extracellular vesicles from two consented donors compared to the mesenchymal stem cells. And as you can appreciate, these two independent consented lines have very similar uh, expression profile. Uh, so next, uh, we... We looked at their protein cargo and microRNA, obviously by RNA-seq and uh, mass spec. And in this diagram, uh, you are seeing uh, the 10 most highly expressed proteins and microRNA. Uh, I should say that we identify 675 intact proteins in this glomeruli, and 2,535 microRNA were expressed. And these profiles really allow us to to um, you know put a fingerprint or on on, on the EVs that characterizes or um, puts, a, puts an identity tag that we, we um, were able to uh, kind of identify and characterize them each time we have a new line. Uh, so uh, from our experience, we're able, and from our experience using the culture methods and isolation methods and characterization methods, we're able to get consistent lots of human EVs yielding the same features uh, as, as highlighted. So next thing I want to point out is that uh, when we compare the, our data from the human EVs and mouse EVs, there is an 80% overlap in terms of protein uh, expression, and uh, which confirms the validity of our derivation method. Uh, from the proteome analysis, uh, we, uh, we, in the human sample, we also uh, confirm the absence of HLA, DR, CD80, and CD86. Uh, so this is important in terms of uh, immunogenicity. 
and um, sequencing RNA sequencing also confirmed uh, that the human EVs do not carry the major microRNA involved in adaptive and innate immune responses, uh, such as MIR 24, 155. So this is important as we move as we move forward uh, using the human EVs. So our assay number two is the potency assay in vitro, where uh, which I talked about uh, for the mice. Uh, and, and so the same was applied here, and the fetal cells, glomerular and the fetal cells were cultured and um, um, you know, treated with VGF to mimic the condition that we have in outward glomeruli. And then the human EVs were applied, and, and, and very similar to what the mouse EVs did, uh, we, we saw an amelioration of VGF uh, protein uh, or decrease of VGF protein in this assay. And uh, um, in the, in the follow-up, our subsequent experiment, we, we we performed the same assay without the cells, without the confounding factor of cells. And again, we observed a direct interaction between the VGF and the human EVs, uh, confirming um, the, the potency of the human-derived EVs uh, being similar, if not better, than the mouse. So this was very encouraging. And then lastly, uh, looking at the in vivo efficacy of the human-derived EVs um, in this experiment, uh, 2.8 uh, times to the 10 power EVs were injected into the 2.5 months uh, age uh, old uh, outward mice. And um, as you can see, the single injection uh, significantly improved uh, VGF uh, activity or activation in isolated glomeruli. Uh, in this example. And lastly, we also measured the proteinuria in these animals. Uh, and again, injection of the human EVs uh, significantly ameliorated proteinuria uh, 10 weeks time period uh, after the injection. So moving forward, uh, I'll give you a little bit information about the RNA-seq uh, analysis we performed. Uh, so mice that were injected with the EVs and mice that were injected, not injected, we isolated their glomeruli one week after the injection and, and sent for RNA sequencing. And this is the data that is being projected in this PCA plot. As you can see, the wild type samples on the left, uh, the, anim, the, the diseased outward mice uh, with the green uh, are you know, um, separating very nicely. Uh, in this uh, 2D plot, whereas the injected uh, samples uh, shown in blue are really separating uh, from both, uh, and they are actually improving at least in one dimension on the y-axis. So this is very encouraging. We're seeing uh, some effect. We performed a lot of comparative analysis between all the groups and uh, to understand uh, and the differences and similarities and how the injection of EVs is really changing or shifting the pathways in, um, in the glomerular cells. And so very briefly, looking at some pathway enrichment analysis, uh, we identified the key mechanisms uh, or, or, or you know, um, key mechanisms or pathways that are affected in outward glomeruli compared to normal. And also looking at the injected animals, we now understand some of the mechanisms that might be uh, involved in, uh, in, you know, leading to improvement in renal function. And uh, as we look further, here I'm showing just two examples in the lipid metabolism panel and cell matrix addition molecules and shown in red with red dots, you can see the number of genes uh, that are being modulated uh, or reversed to normal in this glomeruli. So, uh, um, you know, in addition to lipid metabolism and matrix addition, there are some other areas uh, where the EVs are, are actively, um, you know, uh, having a positive effect, and we are, you know, continuously studying this, these mechanisms. So next, uh, I, I will talk about the uh, 3D hollow fiber bioreactor uh, and studies that we are conducting. Uh, so we know that EV clinical translation is limited uh, by scale up, as I said. Uh, and, and hollow fiber bioreactor can support culture of large number of cells at high densities and can produce large number of EVs. And so in collaboration with uh, fiber cell systems, we are, um, um, we are culturing uh, the you know, human consented AFSCs. And as you can see in this, in this, in this figure, I apologize for the um, you know, low resolution, but uh, the cartridge that's shown in the, 
on the front is loaded with AFSCs and uh, and and fed um, you know by by media. And, and without having to pass the cells over a very long period of time, we can continuously harvest large number of, uh, of EVs. And, and so amniotic fluid stem cell EVs grown in this cartridge produce, produce biochemically and functionally equivalent uh, EVs uh, similar to the you know, 2D derived EVs that we grow in, in, uh, in our culture room um, and with yields that can support clinical scale and GMP compatible system. And so, just like with the 2D uh, EVs uh, growing in our, um, you know, uh, lab, we perform the same assays uh, for the bioreactor derived EVs. And as you can see in this in these figures, the um, the potency assay was not any less than the 2D derived was even better, and the improvement in proteinuria was uh, was. Um, much more better than with a 2D system. So this is very encouraging, and we're looking forward to uh, to um, improving this even even further. So next, uh, I will talk about the uh, the next uh, uh, the direction or next uh, area we are advancing uh, or working towards is the um, is the MRI detection of EVs um, uh, using. Um, Using special dyes, or um, more specifically, um, iron particles, uh, to study biodistribution and potential homing in uh, you know off-target uh, associated toxicities and etc. And so, um, um, MRI um, is uh, is an important uh, modality. Uh, but I, before I go to the MRI, I should mention that there are other modalities, imaging modalities uh, currently available, such as optical imaging um, through bioluminescence and fluorescence imaging, nuclear imaging, that, that can potentially uh, be used for tracking uh, EVs in vivo. But they are, you know, both of these have uh, certain limitations, mainly due to the you know safety concerns, because one involves uh, radioisotopes and uh, optical imaging uh, requires transfections, plasma and fluorescent dyes. And so, in contrast, magnetic uh, imaging, or MRI, is much safer uh, because it uses only um, iron particles um, and uh, provides excellent special resolution that can be used to uh, identify where the EVs are. So, in collaboration uh, with Visicel Medical, and that specializes in MRI, cell and EV tracking uh, technologies were testing the possibility of using MRI to study EV biodistribution in vivo. So we performed a few concept studies demonstrating that a VMI labeling agent is safe on cells and EVs production and does not affect their viability, as shown in the first uh, panel. Uh, that um, The labeled cells or EVs can be detected uh, with electron micro microscope, uh, as shown by the electron dense uh, uh, projections in panel C. And importantly, this uh, labeling agent does not affect the size distribution and production levels of, uh, of EVs, uh, uh, as we confirmed with nanocyte tracking. And importantly, we can use relaxometry to, to measure the, con uh, the iron content in these vesicles. And importantly, uh, the labeled EVs can also be uh, visualized uh, with um, MRI. So, uh, to test the in vivo tracking uh, potential of the VMI dye, we injected healthy and controlled mice uh, with uh, with the EVs uh, with a single dose. Uh, we had two different routes. Uh, one was the retroorbital route, and intracardiac route was applied. My, mice were imaged um, once before the injection and 30 minutes uh, post injection. And as you can appreciate from the uh, from the uh, from these uh, projections, a positive signal was detected only in the outward mice injected via the intracardiac route that is nicely shown in the blow-up uh, projections of the renal cortices in the right. Uh, our uh, MRI fundings were further confirmed uh, by tissue histology, and as you can appreciate in this uh, micrographs, Prussian blue staining is observed only in the kidney injected with the intracardiac route and not uh, through the uh, retroorbital route. And it's only present in the uh, diseased uh, um, tissue and not in the control, uh, um, you know, control mice. 
So uh, intracardiac delivery of EVs to the damaged kidney is more efficient than IV route. And, and we know that the disease really uh, uh, contributes to the homing of the you know, EVs or, or cells uh, um, to, the, to the target organ. And so um, this is an important uh, step moving forward as uh, um, you know, understanding the biodistribution and homing of any reagent that's being injected into the human organism uh, is important uh, and needs to be needs to be well documented. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, by stating that our protocol for human EVs derivation is reproducible and allows for derivation of a large number of EV lots with, uh, with similar identity and purity and potency, um, that uh, human-derived EVs show strong uh, in vivo uh, you know, efficacy. Uh, are shown by our assays, and that the production of large number of EVs using the 3D bio um, hollow fiber bioreactor system uh, is similar to, uh, if not better, than uh, the 2D derived human EVs uh, from our culture, um, you know, laboratory cultures, and that the combination of MRI technology and the VMI, you know, tracking system uh, is a highly applicable technology for real-time info tracking of EVs uh, that can ultimately shift the paradigm in, uh, you know, in safety. And so with this, I would like to conclude and thank everybody in our you know, research group for their individual contributions. I would like to thank our contributors for their, uh, uh, for their support and uh, with the experiments, with their ideas and, uh, and uh, you know, advice and ultimately uh, to all our uh, funding agencies for their support. Thank you. I'll take any questions.